Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Retail Ramble. I'm Caroline Baldwin, I'm the editor of Essential Retail and I'm all the way in Bristol today where we've got a really interesting chat with, I've got two gentlemen with me in the room. We have as the CEO of Bright Pill, Derek O'Carroll. Hi Derek, how are you doing? I'm very good Caroline, thank um, you very much. We also have Lee Adams who's the MD of Open 24-7. Now his company has um, two businesses. You've got Alexander Francis which is the garden furniture shop which is in Bristol and e-commerce website and you've also got is it spy cameras which is a cctv business yes that's oh, right. thank you so much for joining us today i'm really excited to talk about a lack of technology adoption and how businesses small and large can compete with amazon i think it's going to be a really interesting um discussion we've got some statistics and research from bright pearl and we've got real life examples from you lee so um yeah maybe we can start lee introduce your businesses first of all that would be a good start Morning, Caroline. Well, it's actually quite a complicated uh, setup. So we are open 24-7. Uh, under our umbrella, we have two companies. We have a garden furniture business, which is predominantly a seasonal uh, four months of the year, March to around about June uh, business. And then we have a CCTV business, which is the bread and butter. It's also seasonal, but um, predominantly over the course of the year, um, most of our business is done in around about the September to, to March period. Um, as a company, we turn over three million a year, um, and all of that, or the majority of that, is done through e-commerce. I was about to say, so being omnichannel and omnichannel growth, and the mm-hmm. buzzword that is omnichannel that I seem to can't get away from, that's what is it really important to you guys? And um, is it growth within the UK and further abroad, or are you predominantly based here? So, the majority of our business is in the UK. Um, we do sell uh, in Italy, France, Spain, Germany uh, and the US as well, um, but that's a much smaller part of our business. And is it um, something you can... But those are developing. Exactly. Yeah. With technology these days, it's so much easier to be able to do distance selling. Um, mm-hmm. with UTV uh, commerce. <laughs> yeah, well, what you were saying earlier with uh, competing with Amazon, actually we use Amazon to our benefit. Uh, they, will, they will store our product and we can dispatch uh, from Amazon US. Um, or uh, their central um, central de- central depots in Europe for some of our other channels, whether it be eBay, our own e-commerce website. So you've gone down the marketplace route as well as having your own e-commerce business yeah. then. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, before we go into more of that, do you, Derek, do you want to give me a little bit of uh, what Bright Pearl is and a little bit about the research that you guys have been conducting as well? Yeah, sure. So, so Bright Pearl really focus on automating the processes that sit behind Lee's business. And that's what really we're all about. We're all about allowing our customers to get the same efficiencies as Amazon Mm -hmm. by leveraging technology that we make available to the customers. And in the last 12 months, our platform on behalf of our customers invoiced about $1.4 billion worth of business across 24 countries. So we're quite a a sizable business. And I'd point out that um, uh, the biggest trend we see is companies wanting to emulate the technology investments that Amazon did in their early days to be able to get the same level of efficiency because that's that's where the margin opportunity lies and that's where lower costs of going into new countries uh, exist. You know, you, you can set up an Amazon store in 60 seconds using our platform in Germany and start trading and, and have all of your automated accounts as well. So that's really what we focus on. See, so we've mentioned the big A word a couple of times yeah, already. Yeah. And it seems, as I say, that retailers <coughs> across the board are really struggling to keep up. What, what was the latest um, innovation they've launched the other week? An Amazon key to give couriers a key to your house. Yeah. How, that, whether that takes off or not, it still shows that their R&D budget is absolutely insane and they're a company that doesn't really have to make that much profit to answer to the board. How can retailers compete with that when every other retailer needs to turn a decent profit? Where do you even start, Lee? Um, For me, it's efficiency. And it's not only dealing with Amazon, but it's dealing with the influx of Chinese sellers that will work on a much smaller margin. Um, We have pretty much fixed costs in our business, whether we ship... 500 parcels in a day or 5,000 parcels in a day, it doesn't really make too much of a difference because our business is scalable because of the technology behind it. So there are some marketplaces where we have to work on a really tight margin and with Derek Software, we know exactly what that break-even point is. Um, It's... I think the environment these days is significantly more difficult than it used to be. It, it was very, very easy five, six years ago. Um, it was a bit like a gold rush selling online. And, and but, but if you're not 
I was talking to a company actually last week. Uh, they're an e-commerce company, relatively new. They turn over similar sort of money to us. They're about five years old. And um, they were working on uh, Excel spreadsheets. Um, their uh, warehouse department um, had, I think it was around about four people. They were picking and packing around about six, 600 parcels per day. Um, and we talked through the software that we were using yeah. and we worked out that we could save them around about £30,000 a year if they were to switch to a, to a, or they could save, I should say, uh, if they were to switch to, to much better back-end technology. Um, they were manually uh, updating uh, their stock levels. Oh, which, wow. And they had 15,000 SKUs. So as you can imagine... That's a pretty timely process. And so easy with that and many SKUs to get you don't, something you don't wrong. Need to do it. How do you know where all of your product is? Yeah. That's, that's crazy. And are you seeing a similar kind of stories in the research that you've been conducting, Derek? Yeah. So recently we uh, we surveyed about 300 um, mid-size uh, retailers here in the UK. Mm-hmm. And uh, of that group, only 7% were planning to invest in technology. Seven. 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 Oh, wow. Only 7% had planned to invest in technology in order to derive the efficiencies that Lee's talking about. (laughs) It's crazy. It's crazy. And then on the other end, um, in the States, you've got surveys like from uh, from Forbes uh, Mm -hmm. who talk about 90% of CEOs understand that they need to have a digital strategy but only single digit 9% are actually executing upon that. Why, why, yeah, why? So it's, it's an interesting <laughs> I question. I, I think there's a degree of, um, uh, it, especially in the retail sector, you, you, you really need to be, have a high level of awareness. So mm-hmm. as a leader, it's your responsibility to understand what's available to you in the market to yeah. go get that. Um, and there's two types of customers that we see. There's established retailers, legacy, using legacy technology, yeah. so not necessarily built for the, for, for the cloud. And those guys have been, you know, the 30, 40, 50 million dollar business. And then you've got the millennial type businesses that have been using technology from dot, but have fallen into the, into the trap of having disparate systems. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 the barriers to adoption, I suppose, are number one, just the psychology of I don't really understand the technology in the first place. Yeah. So there's a there's a there's a there's a job that we in the industry need to do is to really ex- share the customer stories and the adoption that that there's also a lot of noise out there so there's a lot of companies offering loads of different technologies and it's just difficult for the the cios and the ceos or the senior decision makers to where where do they even begin yeah it's like a marriage Uh, (laughs) I, i mean I mean, if you're going to choose a technology partner and say to that technology partner, you are going to automate Mm. my back office and I'm going to pay you to do that, uh, you have to go through a dating process and you have to really understand what that vendor can do for you, what they cannot do for you. And you have to rock up with your uh, very clear idea on how you're going to run your business. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to know what processes you're going to run and you've got to have that agreed upon your leadership. And, and, And if you don't do that, the marriage won't work. And Lee, how did you come across Bright Brighthold? Did you find them on Tinder or, you know, any of the dating websites <laughs> out there? Um, we actually came across Bright Pile around about six or seven years ago. Okay. Um, and they didn't really, uh, we had built our own systems um, and they didn't really have uh, a platform that was quite right for us at the time. Um, we felt that our internal systems were significantly better. Um, come on, uh, I think another two or three years later, we looked at it again and we looked at a, at a few other propositions as well. Um, and they completely surpassed what we had, what, okay. what we were doing. Um, we're doing it for our one company, for our company, whereas they're doing it for hundreds yeah. of companies. So therefore, there's, they've got so much more input coming in. Can they get updates um, more regularly? Yeah. Maybe sh- do you share uh, We're not a software company. Yeah. We're, so, so we're outsourcing our, 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 uh, our, we were outsourcing all of our back end. Whereas now, I suppose we're doing that in the same way, but we're not doing it to a company that's just dealing with us. It's mm-hmm. dealing with another thousand retailers um, doing the same thing. So, And you're finding definite improvements in that. I'm seeing a bit of a trend, actually, for retailers that have historically built their own systems up mm. and going to vendors because they just, you know, people leave in the business. They they don't write down um, the, the secrets to the software that they've built and you can lo- you can lose talent that way as well. Did you find that was the case? Not so much. It just beca- I think it became it just a bit really clunky. Mm-hmm. Uh, the software that we had was old hat. Yeah. Uh, and really, it got to a stage where we had we looked at our systems and went, okay, we could do with a rewrite. And then you sit down and you look at all the integrations that you have and you mm-hmm. think a rewrite is just too costly. Yeah. So 
getting in someone to help the back end that already has all those things um it, it could kind of a bit of a no-brainer for but us did it benefit you when you were just starting out to um, have everything in house or do you kind of wish that bright pill had been there from the beginning there wasn't really anything there in the beginning. Okay. I started yeah. ten years ago, um, uh, yeah. so we kind of uh, we 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 were kind of guessing and making our way, mm. we're making our way through the retail landscape. Do we wish it was there? Yes, but it, it, I think e-commerce was in its infancy, mm-hmm. so. Um, so it's right place. Right yeah, place. I mean, this is going back to the days where we used to use Sage, and Sage was, yeah. uh, oh, Excel spreadsheets and CSVs, and um, the days where. You couldn't. There was there was no stock management. You used to have to, up, like I was saying earlier, uh, upload your your stock management into your whether it be your website or Amazon manually. Um, I think the difference that it's made for us is. I think half of our business was made up of admin, whereas now it's more like seventy percent is marketing. Okay. Um, so it's significantly reduced so it's our costs. And you've been yeah. able, you, are you able to be more agile and more innovative as well because of that? Um, I think it definitely helps. I think it's just another part of the business that, as an MD, I don't need to worry about. I was just about to say, you just you can yeah. just forget about it. No, and concentrate on other parts that excite you a little bit more than the spreadsheets, I presume. Yeah, and then there's been uh, there's been parts of my business that I've always worried about over the years. Uh, warehouse being one of them, uh, and the efficiencies there. Um, that is a department that I haven't had to worry about now for two years. Um, it, we, the part, the, the the orders come in and the orders go out, um, and we don't have any mistakes. Whereas before, it's dealing with those problems. There's, uh, I think we sat down and, and we worked out the cost of a mispick uh, is around about seventy quid. Wow. So, if you get five or six of those over the course of the week, mm-hmm. uh, quite quickly, that's that's tens of thousands over the course yeah. of the year, and that's for a small business like mine. So. Um, I think having the having Brightpile in place and and or, or having any software in place just basically means it takes it takes the errors out of your business. So you're not firefighting. You can actually spend time looking and planning towards the future. It's also as well you don't have to change your posture in terms of resourcing uh, ahead of peak times. Mm-hmm. So I know your business is seasonal in the summer. That's your your peak time. But now we're coming into. Um, the Christmas period for a lot of retailers, which is which is very high, and we we did a survey and we found about thirty three percent of retailers are uh, defaulting to the classic reaction on okay we're going to have a peak so we're going to hire more people, we're going to get more stock in, and that's obviously just hugely expensive. And what you really want to do is use technology, so there's no there's no increase in your costs when you go through your peak period, and that allows you to focus on optimized pricing get more margin, and then you're in a healthier state to deal with the sale period that, that typically exists thereafter. Interesting you say that. Uh, we've actually just changed uh, this year um, the way that we manage some of our Christmas peaks. So we know roughly how many parcels we can pick in in a day. If the orders are over that, we flick a switch and we get Amazon to fill those parcels. <coughs> um, there's an extra cost of around about 70, 80 p per car- parcel for that. But when we sat down and we did the maths... It's a no-brainer for yeah. the uh, for the Christmas period. It's six weeks of busyness, yeah, um, and there is no peak. So we people say Christmas is your busy period, but actually it doesn't really make any difference to us. No, I'm sure not. And, and that's a good example where Amazon is not it, like everyone refers to Amazon, but they're not the competitor. They've just set the pace. Yeah, and it really comes down to customer excellence and the expectation and the buying behavior is what we're all part of, and that's really causing. Retailers, if they want to survive, they need to l- reach the same level of efficiency as Amazon to be able to use those channels. So, for example, Amazon will penalize a retailer if you have late fulfillment, for example, or if you yeah. use their ordering service and then you don't fulfill on your side, you actually get penalized over time. So it's all about getting to the same level of back office efficiency in order to use Amazon's amazing reach channel uh, to, grow, to grow your top line. What I'd like to talk about now after us just having that little talk about Amazon is all of these exciting future gazing technologies like artificial intelligence and chatbots and Alexa voice um, control. Is any of that available to the smaller businesses? And when I say smaller, just basically smaller than Amazon. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is it doable? 
Well, I, th- I think in context, 20 years ago, we were all talking about clicking. Then mm-hmm. 10 years ago, it was swiping. Yeah. And now it's going to be chatting. Okay. Right? And a prerequisite for chatting, in other words, having an individual talk to Amazon's Alexia and say, um, I would like uh, order a couch in this color and to do that in voice. That's very much here now mm-hmm. for the large companies like Amazon. For mid-sized retailers and small retailers, the prerequisite to be able to do that is just having clean data. And what I mean by that is clean clean data with regard to stock orders and accounts. Knowing exactly where that stock is. It, so it, exa- exactly. That, yeah. And if you have that and you have that accessible in the cloud, which is what we do at, at BrightPro, then the technologies are actually already there now. It's called, the technical term is natural language query. Mm-hmm. And we at Briper, we don't have to go and build that technology. We don't have to go and build artificial intelligence technology. It's available. So Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, they're all making available these really advanced libraries <clears throat> that our development teams can apply to the clean data that we now give our customers. Okay. And so it's only a matter of, um, uh, I'd say, 12 to 18 months, we're going to start seeing customers like Lee taking advantage of being available in an Alexia channel. Mm-hmm. So buying space in the voice area with Amazon websites or uh, sorry, Amazon service. And that's very much here now. And I'd say the last point is the thing that's really changed is the is the macro trend. You know, two, three years ago, an independent retailer in sort of northwest of London would have problems with Wi Fi and internet yeah, connectivity. They don't have that now. No. And the guys in the States had that advantage. You know, they had that advantage because they had the broadband. Mm-hmm. We now in the UK and all over Europe and globally, it's a, it's a level playing ground. So, but you were talking about these voice technologies. Lee, do you really think that your customers are going to go, Alexa, order me a £500 uh, swing seat for my garden? I think it opens up a whole new marketplace. So previously, so previously you would have to have a credit card mm-hmm. to be able to purchase something. Now, if I'm a six-year-old child and I can talk, yes. all of a sudden we've got an age group yeah. that we've never had before. We've got six to, to 18 years old that their parents now are like. So uh, AI is opening up another 20, 30% of the mar- mm-hmm. marketplace. And these are the children that want things. Obviously, there will be things in place. They're ordering to... their Wendy house. <laughs> there was an but example about a doll's house. It wasn't be, that doll ordered. <laughs> Alexa, I'd like a doll's house yeah and then at the end of the month mummy or daddy will look at that wish list and they'll yeah, either they'll true. approve yeah. it or not approve it or mm-hmm. there'll be a situation where they can just order the, what they mm-hmm. want as long as it's below a certain level yeah um i think uh all parents listening now are going, yeah oh god <laughs> did you hear about that radio station that um uh, uh mentioned alexa and said alexa ordered me I think it was it was something like a playhouse. Yes, I think it was a doll's house. Yeah, yeah a doll's house. And all of a sudden, all of these uh, Alexas around the homes then ended up ordering playhouses and they were all delivered next but day. But this is the thing, isn't it, this technology. So I remember when I got my Alexa quite soon after it launched in the UK and every time the advert on telly would come on, she'd switch on next to me mm. and scare the bejeebas out of me. Now I've noticed that they must have updated their software because every time the advert goes on, she stays silent. So it, it's interesting to see that Amazon la- not just they must have had this problem in the US as well. It, it was it came out about a year later in the UK. But they, they wanted to throw it in the market. They decided to get it out there, see how people were using it before they even made those um, adjustments. And it, it's this agile type of, uh, you know, test and learn, get the product out there. I think that's what they wanted to do. They're making, they're not making a profit on Alexa, but they're learning a lot about how their customers are using it. Co- um, correct. The technology is designed to learn more, yeah. the more information and experience it gains. Yeah. So you don't have developers as such releasing new code. The technology in itself needs as much uh, experience of interaction exactly to then improve itself. And um, they've now announced the launch of the Alexa with the um, screen as well, which I think is going to be a, a proper tipping point to com- uh, to conversion. Yeah. I have you got an Alexa? Lee? You said earlier. I've got a number chatting. of them. You got a number of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It woke me up this morning. Oh really? You said you, you're properly using yours all the time. It's not just a glorified speaker. That's all. That's no, 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 not at all. No, Have you shopped me up. with her yet? Uh, yeah, uh, all the time. Oh, I haven't used the buttons yet. Yeah. So if you run out of toilet paper, you can press a button. Oh, the dash buttons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but um, uh, I do use it. I ha- I had to. What I love, and it's going back to what I was saying earlier, is my children use it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old, 
and they are dancing around to Despacito <laughs> every single morning. They can't, the, Alexa doesn't quite understand them. Yeah. So she, they, don't, they can't say, Alexa, play Despacito, but yeah. they press the little button on top Alexa. and they say, Alexa, play Despacito, and now it's listening. And yeah, sure enough, it's playing. So, and these, they are two and three. That's crazy. And they're using this technology to get, it's basically, it's giving them the ability to use a computer without actually have to know, having to know how to use a computer you just need to be able to communicate it's going to be so interesting to see um you know mil- millennials nowadays how they've grown up with smartphones seeing your children grow up with voice technology and goodness knows what is around the corner mm. in, and see how those shopping habits change it's just a uh, fascinating on the um voice technology side of things what 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 do you both think about um chatbots so we're hearing we're writing a lot about chatbots on essential retail and um, shop direct have invested quite a lot into this area but elsewhere i'm not 100 percent convinced i've seen some amazing examples um i think the entertainer have done a has done a christmas chatbot where you can um write, write to santa and say you know can you help me buy a, a a present for a two to three year old boy um and you can even say how long does it take to cook a turkey and i just feel that around christmas time there are loads of chatbots coming out mm. and loads of kind of novelty examples exactly. is that to get consumers on board because in a year's time we're going to be using them more frequently i I really want to see some really good examples of chatbots you either of you seen any um i know skype was one of the main people to start using it Mm -hmm. um and you can get loads of different chatbots depending on what you want to talk about on there um you'd hope that skype i think at the moment (laughs) yeah at the moment it's a gimmick because it's Mm. still it's not it's not quite there um but i think with time and, and like derek was saying earlier the more it gets to learn um, the more that you're going to interact. So at the moment, um, if you want to go and have a look at our terms and conditions or if you want to learn something about our delivery, yeah. you have to go and physically click on something. Mm-hmm. At this moment in time, you're typing into a box. Shortly, you'll be speaking. Yeah. Uh, and then you'll be getting the answers to your questions. How long does this company take to deliver? Yeah. Uh, and it's things like that, that where they're super useful. Mm-hmm. But actually, uh, on a customer services level, um, I think that at this moment in time, uh, a person is definitely... Uh, the in- interaction with a person is going to be a lot more successful. And yeah. I think as well, sometimes they can just get frustrating. Of course. Uh, you can answer those, where yeah. is my parcel, is kind of an obvious one. Yeah. You can see what the customer's ordered recently and realise what they're on about. But if it's a more detailed problem or query, they kind of fall, fl- fall flat a little bit. But mm. um, how about you, Derek? What have you... Well, I, I, I actually think, I, I think we're witnessing the beginning of the end for apps. Okay. Because if you consider the consumer journey is from A to B, the B is being the what they're looking for. Of old, you would go and you'd probably go to a website, you fill something out, then you get the answer, or you download an app and you go and use the app to book your flight. I think now there's a, um, uh, a consumer base that out, is out there that use Facebook Messenger, yeah. and they talk to Facebook Messenger, and they type obviously, but they also talk to it. And, and I think that's where chatbot is gonna come in. So you'll chat through your Facebook to a service that then will say and give you the answer. Mm -hmm. So no longer are you downloading an app, going through the registration, giving your email out and all that sort of jazz. It'll all be done through Facebook or whatever messenger app you're using. Flights is a really good example of that. You just need the mobile wallet pass, you don't need the whole app. Exactly, and that's what I was talking about earlier. So, So those really useful cases, which is all about time and the fact that you've got these young people who don't even like typing, they want to talk to Siri. I think that's what we're going to see. So I do think this is the beginning of the end for um, standalone apps. And we're going to see a big rise in uh, companies and retailers um, leveraging uh, their back office systems to make those systems available to their employees to serve their customers better using things like like Facebook Messenger. So that's what we're working on in, in Bright Pearl is be able to allow Lee to use Facebook, Facebook Messenger to say, hey, Bright Pearl, um, what are my sales today in Germany? Or... Hey, Bright Pearl, uh, what's my most effective product today? So those type of use cases are adding real value because it's back to this A to B. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to see a big, big um, uh, drive around B to B. So business to business or business owners asking for intelligence from services like Bright Pearl using chat, not not query, not search. Why does it just need to be consumer? And sometimes these technologies come out like Google Glass that comes out to the consumer first and isn't really adopted, but that... Is a good example of something that would be really useful in B2B? Maybe chatbots will take off there first. Oh, I, I think so. Like, I'm sure Lee would, on a daily basis, he's got some key questions that he always wants mm. to 
uh, uh, at and by next year I want Lee to be able to use Facebook Messenger and, yeah. and talk securely back into the system and for, to get his answers. Is that something you want, Lee? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. At the, this moment in time, every morning I, I, I ask Alexa what's up mm-hmm. and she tells me my, my, what's going on with my day and if that can also be integrated with my business as well. My mm. second port of call after then asking Alexa what's up is be getting out my phone and having a look at my business. Exactly. So um, being able to do that automatically, it, it just feels quite natural, doesn't it? Yeah. Is, is it quite tricky, though? Because I'm thinking with the uh, your taking your Alexa example, um, I find that there are so many exciting technologies out there when it comes to Internet of Things and voice and all these future gazing, whether it's a Samsung fridge or, an, or your Alexa or your iPhone, but not all of them talk to each other because they're all on different systems. Is that something you're going a challenge that you'll have, Derek, going forward when you're improving your technology and your service? Is the fact that you need to be able to make sure it speaks to Google Home, to Alexa, to Siri, to all of them? Is, is that yeah? Is so that so concerning? so on my side, there's there's obviously the, I need a single system with clean mm-hmm. data that's available twenty four by seven to yeah. use Lee's name, and then the um, the interaction point, the messenger like Facebook Messenger, like Amazon, like Siri. Um, they are the new browsers for yes. interaction, yeah. right? And voice is the new, is the replacing of the type. The technology that sits behind to make it all work together is actually much more advanced than, than, than people uh, understand. So for me to make a system uh, be able to talk to Lee, it's about four days of development time now because I'm not using, it, it's already there. The technology yeah, yeah. is ready for me to use. The only thing you need is you need to have the data that's clean. Yeah. And you need to have it clean across online stores and warehouse. Mm-hmm. And that's what Bright Pearl's vision is all about. We, we're automating all of that. So you've got one single repository of data so that Lee then can go and take advantage of the next growth area, which is going to be this sort of um, voice marketplace. Yes, sounds very exciting stuff. And be- it's going to happen very quickly. Oh, really? Over the next 12, 24 months, you're going to see more and more of this type of... Um, I'm chasing uh, on that, Lee, in, 12, in 12 months, make sure you've yeah, got you your come voice. Back. <laughs> and as a retailer, that's something that we want to hear. Yeah. Uh, but also as well, it's something that we probably, well, we, we, we would struggle to do ourselves because we're a retailer, we're not a technology company. And so uh, having someone like Derek on board, it really does help. But, but that's, what, that's where I think, I think it, re- retailers need to seriously look, you know, back to our point about 7% of retailers actually adopting technology. Mm-hmm. You, retailers really need to, be far more serious about this, otherwise they will die. Yeah. They won't be around unless they innovate and get the efficiencies in the back office because they will not be able to compete. No, they, it's so true. It, it, before we wrap up, we've been we've talk, covered so many bases today, guys. I'd like you both to have a think about the one technology that's coming up or already exists that's really going to change your business for the better in the next maybe five years' time rather than we've already looked at 12 months. What's exciting you for the future? At the moment... Uh, <laughs> big question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is a really big question. Um, so, I think some very really smart big companies out there have already incorporated this, and it's about it's about outsourcing. So, uh, we will be great at marketing, mm-hmm. um, but I think we will outsource everything, um, uh, whether it be uh, web design or um, fulfillment. Um, and it's, company, it's companies like Amazon or fulfillment centers that are going to be taking that on. So we can just concentrate on, on the things that we're good at. Um, uh, outsourcing has been around for a number of years, but I think it will become, with robots, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it would be impossible for me to enter that market, art marketplace because of the costs involved with purchasing uh, those sorts of things and having yeah. those economies of scale. Um, so it's all going to become really, much more slicker, automated, yeah. something, again, for you not to worry about. Yeah. That would be, that would be the dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't think, I don't in five years' time, I don't think I'll be going to work. I'll be at work at home. And mm-hmm. uh, I think I think our business, the business landscape, is going to change massively over the next few years. Um, it's exciting, but nerve-wracking, too. Yeah. Because you worry that you're going to get, you're going to be old. You're going to, you're, you're, you're going to be... You will be old. You will, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my technology, the, the things that we're doing now, just won't be uh, uh, up to date. That's the, you that's don't the know biggest what's worry. To, what's the first thing that you need to change? And I'm prioritizing when yeah. technology is moving so fast at the moment. It's quite terrifying as well yeah. as exciting, I suppose. Derek, what, what about you? What's your key takeaway here? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm quite excited um, to see the emergence of sort of next generation retailers, those mm -hmm. retailers that spend minimum time on the back office and all the time on developing new cool products for, for niche. Um, so that's one area. Um, and then from a technology perspective, I think it's um, providing those retailers with um, contextual advice using their own data. Yeah. So, hey, if you moved these thousand orders from this warehouse to that warehouse, you get another 0.4% margin, all coming from artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which it's a big word, but in actual fact, it's statistical enhancement. So allowing a customer to use their own data to make better business decisions just around those key areas that have an impact on margin is what we're pretty excited about. Great. Well, maybe in 12 months' time, we can have this conversation again and see where, um, where if you're delivering that uh, voice technology in the chat Absolutely. box yet. And Look forward to it. We should get it in the diary now. Yes, let's do, let's, do let's, get, let's get it in 12 months, <laughs> probably earlier. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us on Essential Retail's Retail Ramble podcast. We've got uh, Lee here from Open 24-7. Thank you so much. And Derek from Bright. Bright Pearl. And to all you listeners out there, uh, keep listening for the next episode, which will be with you soon.